very happy to welcome Dr. Helen Zamuelli, who is the Head of Research for the Bruges Group and is probably as well known there, but also probably better known uh, with, as her co-authorship with Dr. Richard North of the very well-known website EU Referendum. And in fact, if, that, if some of you haven't actually uh, seen that, I suggest that you make it one of your favorites because it carries an enormous amount of comment and information that I think will be valuable to anybody who wishes to see us, first of all, have a referendum and secondly, be rid of the clutches of the EU. Yeah. So without further ado, I welcome Helen Zamuelli. Um, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, I've got my uh, mobile phone here, not because I'm expecting a call, but because that is my watch. Um, I, I always feel it's incredibly rude to put a mobile phone out, but uh, I haven't got a watch. Um, I am extremely grateful for your invitation to come and talk to you. Several reasons. One is that I realise this is not entirely UKIP organisation, but um, I claim, but it, it is kind of UKIP. Um, and I claim to be the first person who was perched from UKIP way back when UKIP was first founded. Um, I have since then made up with all the, all, almost all the people that I fell out with at the time. Um, the second reason why I think I'm particularly grateful and find it slightly surprising that I was invited, and I think by the time I finish my speech, a lot of people might find it a little surprising, um, is that I'm a dreaded think I'm an immigrant. Now, I have never been caught drink driving because I don't drive. So that certainly is not on my record. I came to this country when I was 14. And I'm with my family, and we were very grateful for it. And I appreciate that perhaps not everyone in this room is terribly happy about having people like me around. Oh. Um, I have even been known to use the National Health Service. <laughs> I have also been known to pay taxes for the National Health Service, but that's another matter. So that's <clears throat> another thing. And the third reason why perhaps it is a little surprising that I'm here is, as David said, as the chairman has pointed out, I'm head of research of the Bruges Group, uh, an organisation that was uh, referred to earlier today. And I think I would like to correct one or two misstatements there. Just one or two. The Bruges Group has never had a Chatham House session. It does not have Chatham House sessions. It will not have Chatham House sessions. We, that is not how we operate. We advertise publicly. We ask anyone and everyone who's interested in our subject to come and talk to us, uh, to come and listen to our speakers. And in those circumstances, you cannot have Chatham House rule. What, as, and I speak feelingly as head of research, because believe me, articles and papers come my way that make my hair stand on end even more than it does already. <laughs> um, we do prefer well-researched, well-attributed arguments. And we're not very keen on the argument that is based on, to quote a former prime minister, trust me, I'm a regular kind of guy. <laughs> now, moving right along, EU referendum. I have so many hats that I really sort of thought I would mention one or two more. One is EU referendum, which is actually, I, partly I want to advertise it, of course, but also it's an important development in our campaign that I'm sure no to id has found as well, is that we now have the internet. Now, I know people are always complaining about the BBC won't have us, that this won't have us, that that won't have us. These are all rather difficult, these are great difficulties. Millions of people listen to the BBC. If we can't get our ideas over to the BBC, those millions probably will not hear us. However, um, and it hasn't quite developed in Britain to the extent of the United States. Political debate has changed, certainly in the United States completely, and it is slowly changing in Britain because of the internet. I'm very sorry that people who are organizing these extremely useful parish referendums, parish votes to have a referendum, will not think about the website and will not think about the internet. Um, because that is where we are strong. That is where 
we can go past the kind of, not exactly censorship, but the kind of establishment opposition that we have never quite been able to overcome in the mainstream media. Um, now, I actually do not go down corridors of power um, and do not have secret meetings with anybody. Absolutely every meeting I have is usually well known, just about everybody. Um, <clears throat> but a little while ago, I spoke um, in a well-known think tank that does have a website in Washington, specifically on the question of the blogosphere. And then I said that the difference, the American blogosphere grew up to a great extent, although there is very much a left-wing blogosphere, because the right, which is actually, as it turns out, the majority in the United States, felt that they had no outlets through the mainstream media. The only way they could uh, work was first the um, talk radio, which we actually cannot do because of the laws that govern broadcasting in this country, <coughs> and secondly, through the blogs. And if you think about Dan Rather, if you think about the way the New York Times and various other newspapers have been skewered by the blogs on their reporting from Iraq and from Afghanistan, and um, recently there was a huge hoopla about articles in the New Republic, which turned out to be completely false about uh, supposed behavior by the American army in Iraq, and then turned out that the stories were about Kuwait, and anyway, they weren't really about this, and they were, so the whole thing was a pack of lies. But if it hadn't been for the blogs, no one would have known that. In Britain, I said, we don't have that problem, because we do actually have right-wing newspapers when it comes to domestic politics. We have the Telegraph, we have the Mail, on and off the Sun, whatever. But where we do have problems is getting across um, certain views about the European Union. And that's where the internet and the blogs, and under their influence, some of the mainstream media, have been so crucially important. So I'm not just um, promoting my blog, I'm promoting um, anybody else. Um, I know at least one person in the audience has his own blog. Um, these are really important methods forward. And what Richard and I, mostly Richard, because he, he and his son do the technical side, have now started doing is setting up, well, it has been set up, in fact, something called the umbrella blog, in which other people can come into uh, the blog, and what they'll have is, if, they're, if they are part of it, then they can just put a little bit of their posting on the umbrella blog, link, links to their own blog, and then the information spreads. So people who look at the umbrella blog will say, oh, that's really interesting, I, uh, you know, I found that interesting. I mean, Neil Heron's on it. It's, and, um, and then they think, oh my goodness, there's another one I've never heard of. So anyway, it's all going out there. Um, Moving on to a subject I'm actually supposed to be talking about. <laughs> just, um, <clears throat> I don't know, <coughs> I'm afraid <coughs> I missed the, um, the earlier sessions um, coming down, fr um, down from London. Um, so I don't know if anybody mentioned the um, latest um, saga of Northern Rock. Um, but what, there were various aspects of it, and quite a lot of it is irrelevant to what we're discussing, but what actually caught um, my attention in respect to this is obviously Mervyn King's um, evidence to the committee in which he said that, well, in fact, uh, Northern Rock was not insolvent, but they had liquidity problems and Bank of England wanted to help out. But what they wanted to do was to do it quietly, but because of an EU directive, they couldn't. It became public, which caused the panic, which caused the run. And then there was a bit of a discussion um, what, did the directive really say that? Or is there a regulation that says, in certain circumstances, you have to do it, in other circumstances, you do not? And uh, as it happens, we still don't know the answer, whether they were forced by a directive to make this public, or whether they could have just quietly shored things up temporarily, nobody knew, nothing would have happened. And that actually raises an extraordinarily difficult problem, which is not only we, we don't always know who governs this country, we don't even know what the laws are. Because this is, because, I mean, this was a perfect example. 
And this is a really important issue. And yet the, um, what is he, Mervyn King, director, no, well, governor. Um, the governor of the Bank of England doesn't know for certain exactly what the laws are, what the rules are that govern the banking sector in this country. And this is a very difficult situation. Um, now, I have heard arguments that Mervyn King may have some, um, may just not know himself. I don't think so. I don't think you get to that position if you are stupid. Um, so it is extremely complicated, and these complications are going to get worse as the EU's financial services legislation, which was a 10-year plan and if started on a second 10-year plan, unrolls itself. And the city, which incidentally is the biggest um, sort of money provider for this country, will find itself regulated by laws, rules, regulations that absolutely nobody will understand. This is not a happy situation. Um, what can one do about it? Well, I think I agree with Guy. Coming out of the European Union is not really the end. It's only the beginning of a very, very long process. It'll take considerably longer than two years. Um, <clears throat> in the meantime, of course, we have this problem of the referendum. Now, yet another hat of mine is I'm on the steering committee of the referendum rally that is happening on the 27th of October, and I'm happy to say that we've already got speakers. Roger Helmer will speak, Nigel Farage will speak, Christopher Booker will speak, Neil Heron will speak, and we've got Steve Ratford from the Liberal, the real Liberal Party. It'll be interesting to hear what he has to say about the Lib Dems, though it's not actually his remit to talk about them. Hmm? Yes. yes, it's probably not in public, but it would be quite nice afterwards to hear what he has to say about the Lib Dems. <coughs> And what we have been told by a number of people who oppose the referendum is that, well, a referendum actually undermines representative democracy. We've got parliament, and it should be parliament that legislates. Um, now, this is actually a, a somewhat inaccurate point of view, in my opinion. The problem we have with our representative democracy is that at no time, and this has been a historical problem, unlike the American system, we do not have proper separation of powers. Um, there is a long historical reason for that. It's the way it's developed from the 17th century. But in actual fact, so as a consequence, we don't have proper checks and balances. And in actual fact, if a government, which is part of parliament, not separate the way it is in the United States, <clears throat> has a decent majority in the commons, it can turn itself into, and almost always does, again, this is not a conspiracy, this is what governments do. If they see a bit of power, they will grab it. That's what governments do. Um, they do turn themselves into what is effectively an elected, uh, an elected dictatorship. Um, there is no way of checking it. Not at this stage. The only very mild form of controlling what goes through the Commons is the House of Lords. And even that very mild form is now being eroded. The uh, government is absolutely determined to destroy the little power that the House of Lords has. So in those circumstances of not having a constitutional control over the government, there is no constitution that one can appeal to, not, no constitution because the constitution does not, that cannot control what parliament says. And it's no good saying um, Bill of Rights, Magna Carta, because a lot of that has mm. long ago disappeared. Um, you know, I believe the Bill of Rights gives us all the right to bear arms. Where is that, one asks oneself. Um, but so in the circumstances, the only check, the only control over a government, 
And it's a very imperfect check and control. I mean, I, I appreciate all the problems with plebiscites. It would be a referendum. Now, clearly, we cannot call a referendum over every bit of issue, but when it's a serious constitutional issue, and Parliament that proclaims itself sovereign, but is not, it is the people who are sovereign. We merely hand Parliament power temporarily, and it has no power to give, a, and it should not have power to give the sovereignty of this country away. Right. At that point, the people, the sovereign people, must have a right to control. And that, Mr. Chairman, is my argument for a referendum in, um, in a representative democracy. Obviously, I prefer to have a representative democracy. I also would like, once we're out of the European Union, and tomorrow is too late, um, <laughs> to see certain constitutional changes in this country. I would like to see another Bill of Rights, because the old one has been forgotten. And there's no particular reason. If they could do it in 1689, they can do, we can do it now. We are, no worse, we are no worse than they are. And perhaps one day we will have to think of a one-document constitution to this country. Um, because, one, that means Parliament will not be able to undermine our laws and our liberties. So it's something to think about. How long have I got? Um, what the, what the new treaty will mean to Britain. Right. Well, I actually think it's, it's a kind of irrelevant issue because there isn't... We've all been through this with when it was called the Constitutional Treaty. We've all been through the fact that the European Council is now going to be... Uh, actually, that, that one, that one we, has not been discussed before. The European Council is now actually going to be not an intergovernmental body, but a body within the European Union. So it actually becomes a government, and it will be controlled, presumably, by the European Court of Justice. So that is actually rather a large step, which has been somewhat swept under the carpet and has caused a huge outcry when it was revealed first by my colleague Richard North and then by Christopher Booker uh, in the Sunday Telegraph. And since then, we've had a little bit of discussion, but this is quite important. Um, interestingly enough, very soon after that, I don't think the two are connected, Jean-Louis Trichet has pointed out that the new treaty makes the, the ECB, um, the, the, the bank, also an EU body, which means it'll come under the EU's control. Now, if you remember, the whole idea of the single currency was being sold, that this will be an independent body, it will set um, its... Um, uh, interest rates as it wishes to. Now, if this treaty goes through, that will, be, that will finish. It will no longer be an independent body. It will be an institution of the European Union, and as such will be under the control of the European Union, which puts a completely different complexion on it. There is the Charter of Fundamental Rights, which is going to be a godsend to lawyers. Um, and... Um, so, which has so many different and conflicting rights that I think we are going to see cases going on for years and years and years. Um, so, but what it will strengthen, of course, is um, again a development, a trend that we have seen, sadly, since before we entered the common market, because nothing comes out of nothing, and there was a reason why. This country was pushed into the common market. Um, and that is the development of what I call managerial governance as opposed to constitutional governance. The idea that legislation is done on a managerial basis, which is how the European Union um, operates. You have a 10-year plan of financial legislation, another 10-year plan of food labelling legislation, which may sound unimportant, but believe me, it affects an awful lot of people. Um, a lot of firms are groaning at it. Um, and it is not discussed in Parliament. In fact, Parliament's irrelevant. 
All parliaments are irrelevant. The European Parliament is completely irrelevant. I mean, whenever I write about the European Parliament, I tend to refer to it as a toy parliament, because what is it? It is a toy. Um, but our own parliament is irrelevant, because the legislation just rolls out. We have elections. We have another government. The European Parliament changes. We have a different co commission. Doesn't matter. The legislation just goes on, like some mammoth five-year, ten-year mm. plan. And they, it, it does go through. I mean, it's a complicated business. I don't think I've got time to go through all the details of how legislation goes through the European Union, although I can answer questions of that. But let's say when it hits the European Parliament, and it isn't discussed openly the way it is here, um, it goes through the committees. The, the, the directive or the regulation that's actually going through the European Parliament may well have started years previously, before this particular parliament was elected. So it actually doesn't matter that in the meantime, people have elected a more right-wing parliament or a more left-wing parliament. It, it just, so it, there, is, there is no longer the feeling that legislation should be done in some kind of an adversarial uh, process, in an open process, through political institutions. And what this treaty is going to do, of course, is strengthen that position in which no country in the European Union will be able to legislate openly. It is, go it is a managerial process. It carries on, it carries on. And I'm sad to say that in many ways the ideas are coming, and this is the last thought I will leave you with, from our own people who think that Britain will actually do quite well out of a stronger European Union. For 30 years they've been thinking that, for 30 odd years they've been thinking that, and for 30 odd years they've been wrong. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I, for one, am certainly not going to accept that the period of representative democracy in this country is coming to an end, which is the phrase that was used, or the quote that was used by Peter Mandelson uh, two or three years ago. Mm -hmm. I think I've been fighting, and I'm sure all of you have been fighting, to ensure that that statement will never come true. Yeah. And I hope that we will go on fighting to ensure that it doesn't. Can I take some questions, please? I think the lady there, did you wish to start off? No? Yeah, silence. Oh, my Excuse me, can you, can you shut David? the audio? We can't hear. We can't hear. I'm sorry about that. David Abbott. I, I noticed, uh, Helen, that you didn't mention when you were talking about the Constitution the role of the Queen in this, uh, because she did take a solemn oath at a coronation to govern us according to our traditional uh, laws and so on, and not to let any foreigners govern us, I think that's part of the coronation oath, um, she would need, I presume, to sign whatever uh, bill it is uh, that would take us even deeper into the European Union. Is there any way that we, do you see that we can influence her so that that doesn't happen? Um, I'm, I'm very glad that you're doing your rally on the 27th. I was suggesting that after the rally, we should all march down to Buckingham Palace and make a bit of a fuss. I imagine she won't be there, actually. It's Saturday, so she'll probably be away. Um, not that I know, because the Queen is another person I never actually see. Um, but um, I can't... I don't see that it's... Um, I don't see anything very much is going to happen. She signed all the other treaties and she, all the other bills, and she will sign this one. Um, it's not being governed by foreigners. We are part of it. I think that's something, one of the things that actually impressed me by da about David Miliband, and very few things impressed me about David Miliband, but this was one, in fact it probably was the only one, is that he actually told the truth. Um, now this is not something you expect from a foreign secretary. This is not what they are for. No. But um, that's okay, he's been slapped down. Um, but he, in his very first um, long interview in the Financial Times, he actually told the truth when they were saying, well, you know, what about alliance with the United States, alliance with the European Union? And he said, we're not allied with the European Union. We are part of it. This is not being governed by foreigners. This is, 
We are part. This is a government that is being created by our government and all the other member states. So the new president of France, whatever you think of him, is part of our government. But similarly, the new prime minister of Britain, whatever you may think of him, is part of the French government. So it isn't quite being governed by foreigners. It's not like being invaded or um, <laughs> taken over or anything like that. And um, as I say, I prefer to be able to refer back. You can, look, you can see exactly how this uh, structure works. Um, I don't pretend to be a regular kind of guy, so you've got to trust what I say. Um, Michael, yes, you have a quick... Do you want to use the microphone, or I pass it to him sufficiently loud? I think we can hear you. <laughs> um, uh, do people, can people at the back hear him? No. Yes, Michael Schroeder. I just uh, a little bit of Bruce Group politics. When I was chairman of the Bruce Group, we did go to Chatham House. So we did but not. I won't, I won't say any more than that. Uh, I'm sure it follows a different policy after I left. No, uh, it's never followed that policy. It did Can we hear the question first, please? There <laughs> isn't a question. He's <laughs> stating things. <laughs> so you're getting a bit, the, 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 ladies and gentlemen, you're getting a bit of Bruges Group internal politics here. <laughs> Not internal. <laughs> a difference of opinion within the group. Uh, coming back to this question that uh, David very sensibly raised minutes ago, uh, it's perfectly clear that the Queen could, if so minded, refuse royal assent to the Constitution or Reform Treaty Bill. And it is perfectly clear that one ground on which Her Majesty might, being entirely a matter for her, refuse consent is that the bill, it raises constitutional matters which do not carry the weight of opinion in the country behind them, uh, particularly if there has been no referendum. In, in the light of that, are you sh still sure that we really want to get rid of our constitution, which does in fact have very august and very powerful checks and balances, and replace it with an inferior European-style Britain constitution, which is bound to leave something out? No. And next question. Uh, somebody that I hasn't asked before. Is there a gentleman up there at the top, in the top row? Come on, try it with your own voice. <laughs> right. Um, you mentioned earlier about the European Council. Come here. Yes. Um, is that the European Council of Ministers? Yes, it is. It's, um, when it's individual ministers meeting, it's the Council of Ministers. When it's actually the heads of government meeting, it's the European Council. Yes. Yes, it is. Okay. And then, very quickly, the last two questions, uh, gentlemen on you, either side of the aisle here. You, talked, all, yes. you talked about a European Parliament. But as the Commission has got so many communists from the ex-communist countries, would it not be better to refer to it as a Soviet? No. <laughs> Why? Because the Commission is one thing, the Parliament is another thing, and it has also got a number of people who have actually fought against the communist system very courageously, very bravely, and to whom freedom matters a good deal more than, as Guy pointed out, to a lot of people in this country, so no. Okay, and finally the question from the gentleman. On yes, the you mentioned the blogosphere as an important yes. uh, way of getting our message across, uh, and I partly agree with you, although I think the trouble is that our media is so fragmented, the blogosphere is so huge, there are so many different sites, that you're only ever going to attract a small core of the people who are really interested, like the people in this room who are really interested. <coughs> We're not going to get out to the vast majority of people. Mm. We've got 100,000 signatures on the biggest petition for this referendum, which is the Telegraph petition. I think, I think it's something like 100,000, which is actually a lot less than we had in 2004, when the old constitution yeah. was first raised. And one of the problems is that we're not attracting, we're not yet attracting the major media, the Sun and the Mail, the big circulation papers. They, I, I'm afraid, I'm sorry to say, but they are probably our best hope of waking the country up. And unless we can sort of get them on board somehow, I, I fear, you know, we're going to be a little bit too small. What do you think? I think the Daily Telegraph would be extremely fed up if it heard you say that they are not part of the major media. Um, 
I'm, I don't speak for the Daily Telegraph, but I would guess they would not like that. Um, didn't the Sun have its own referendum? Uh, referendum petition. I think the Sun and the Mail, which we've had over a million. Yeah, um, not this time round. I think there is a problem with petitions. I think um, a lot of people, I mean, a lot of everything you say is is quite correct, and this is why we need to have these networks. But the, pro but the special problem with petitions is that there are a lot of people in this country who quite correctly, in my opinion, know that petitions get you nowhere. Um, we saw the anti-road um, pricing petition, which, again, mm. it doesn't matter what you think about the issue, attracted how many? A million and a half signatures? I mean, it was a huge number. Well, that was actually a few, a bit less, the Countryside Alliance petition. Um, but that was the biggest one. <coughs> and the government said, well, thank you very much. We're really very interested, but we're actually not going to pay any attention to this. And you see, when you get that, people aren't going to sign petitions. Why should they? Um, you know, what difference is it going to make? So I think, I don't think signatures to petitions are indicative necessarily of the opinion it's simply indicative of the fact that people don't think petitions. Well, and so what? You know, I mean, it's like saying, you know, it doesn't matter if you win, you've just got to play the game. I don't think so. I think we want to win. So that we end on an upbeat note, do you have any good news for us? <laughs> yes. The government inevitably is inefficient. So... However afraid we are, and that's whether it's our own government or the European Union of which we are part, uh, it doesn't matter. They are always going to screw up. <laughs> okay, right. I think, I think we've, we've had enough questions now. Thank you very much. We must move on. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Helen Zamuelli, for what has been a very interesting and thought-provoking session. <laughs>